Ah, stupid people. Let's be honest, they're basically everywhere in modern culture. From politics, to music, to YouTube. Everywhere you look you're confronted by vapid, brain-dead morons dispensing their unwanted and uninformed opinions like mentally challenged Delphic oracles. But truly, nowhere in this fair land has a higher preponderance of stupid people than modern day Hollywood, basically the epicenter of all things idiotic. Girls and boys can both identify with a male lead. But yeah. boys cannot identify with a female lead. Oh, absolutely. <laughs> So I suppose it's kind of appropriate that we should find ourselves confronted at last with Glass Onion, a glorious, vibrant, defiant celebration of all things moronic, made by a man who gleefully set out to burn one of cinema's most beloved IPs to the grounds. Tell me, how's that trilogy coming along, Ryan? But now that he's subverted Star Wars into oblivion, he's since turned his spherical cranium to the murder mystery genre, because that's what all truly smart people aspire to, don't you know? Now, this wasn't exactly heartening news for someone like myself, because us Brits have got a long and storied history when it comes to fictional detectives, from Sherlock Holmes to Hercule Poirot, Miss Marple, and the greatest sleuth of all, Lovejoy. Anyway, his first effort, Knives Out, turned out to be an inexplicably successful whodunit, provided that you didn't mind the endless conveniences, plot contrivances, cliched one-note characters, and unbelievable series of coincidences that were basically the only thing holding the entire plot together. It was a silly, borderline incoherent movie dressed up in a shiny veneer of inventive respectability, and elevated by a talented cast that were way better than the script actually deserved. And now he's back again to massage his own ego with Glass Onion, a star-studied sequel that continues the adventures of the preposterous detective Benoit Blanc, complete with foghorn leghorn accent and the most obnoxiously flamboyant wardrobe since Paul Feig stepped outside. I can't believe you think that real human beings are supposed to look like this, Ryan. Anyway, whatever. So the movie takes place on a secluded private island owned by tech billionaire Miles Braun. Miles is hosting a murder mystery party with his group of rich asshole friends, but the unexpected arrival of Chris Benoit Mont Blanc throws a bit of a spanner in the works because Miles didn't actually invite him. So if he didn't, then who did? Now, you might think that an uninvited guest at an exclusive party like this would be a cause for concern, and that Miles would probably ask him to leave. But apparently it's okay because Blanc is so damn famous that even the world's richest man turns out to be a complete fanboy. Because I guess in this bizarro alternate world, amateur detectives are like celebrities or something. I don't fucking know. But keep this fact in mind because it's going to be very important later. Equally important is the arrival of Andy, Miles' former business partner that he eventually forced out of the company and who naturally isn't on very good terms with him now. Kinda makes you wonder why he'd invite her in the first place, doesn't it? Anyway, pretty soon it becomes clear that all is not well within the group of friends. A couple of them are being railroaded into supporting a new alternative energy source that Miles is planning to launch, despite the fact that it's highly dangerous. Keep that fact in mind too because it's also going to be important later. Another witness sees Miles having an affair with his girl girlfriend, while still another one is embroiled in a political scandal because of his interference. Okay, so you've got a bunch of diverse people, all with valid motivation to kill Miles, so guess what happens next? Here's a clue, it's not what you'd expect. It's a hard one to describe, but basically this is where the movie does something that absolutely pisses me off, because it's so completely out of left field and ridiculous that it absolutely ruins your investment in anything that's happening. Are you ready? So it turns out that Andy is in fact her identical twin sister, Helen. No way! The real Andy died a week earlier of apparent suicide, but Helen's convinced that foul play was involved and that one of Miles' friends was responsible, so she contacted Blanc to investigate. And he came up with the genius idea to suppress the news of her sister's death so that Helen could come to the island and impersonate her. Wow, lucky she happened to have a twin sister, and that she left behind a detailed journal of her entire experiences up until this point so that Helen would know everything she needs to blend in with her friend group. It's also extremely lucky that Blanc wasn't immediately turned away from the island when he tried to blag his way in, or that the killer didn't immediately try to take Helen out when he saw that the woman he apparently already killed was now alive and well. Particularly when that killer was the same guy who owns the fucking islands. Yeah, in case you hadn't guessed already, Miles himself was Andy's killer, because it turns out that she was the one who came up with the original idea for his tech company, but he stole it and forced her out, bribing and blackmailing the others into supporting him in court. And when Andy found a crucial piece of evidence and threatened to reveal it to the world, Miles killed her and hid the evidence away in his office, instead of, you know, destroying it. 
keep that in mind too, because it's also going to be important later. But it's all okay anyway, because then Helen uses a chunk of the new energy source to blow up the entire house with herself and the others inside it, but somehow it doesn't kill any of them. And then all of Miles' friends turn against him, and they all celebrate at the end like this is some kind of epic win, conveniently ignoring the fact that they're all absolutely going to go to jail for perjury, attempted murder, concealing evidence, interfering with police investigations, extortion, bribery, arson, property destruction... You know, it genuinely undermines my faith in humanity that a lot of people out there consider this film a smart, well-made movie. The only way I can rationalise it is that just like Steve Jobs, Ryan Johnson seems to have some kind of reality distortion field around him and his work, somehow convincing people that he's this crazy auteur genius, cleverly subvert entire genre tropes to tell a fascinatingly original story. In reality, Glass Onion is like a Ferrari chassis wrapped around a Ford Escort. On the surface, it seems like this complex, multi-layered mystery plot that gives up a little bit more information as each layer is unravelled, but the truth is that it's nothing but the flashy veneer of intelligence with nothing lying beneath. The story at the heart of Glass Onion is so riddled with cliches, tropes, conveniences and contrivances that it's genuinely incredible how anyone can buy into it. Like, if any single one of these forced plot elements didn't happen exactly as they play out, then the whole story would have collapsed around it. Like, what if Miles had refused to let Helen and Blanc onto his island? Wouldn't Helen's presence here with the world's most famous detective be a very obvious red flag that he was compromised? Why didn't news of the death of a high-profile tech project did you reach the press sooner? If Andy was so smart, why didn't she anticipate the danger she was in when Miles suddenly showed up at her home immediately after she threatened to expose him to the world? Wouldn't that be a very clear sign that he was there with ill intent? What if one of the group had asked Helen a personal question that she should have known the answer to but didn't? I mean, I'm pretty sure Andy didn't record every single thought and event in her journal. What if Miles had security cameras installed in any of the house's public areas and picked up on the conversations between Blanc and Helen? What if Miles did didn't have fax machines in all of his residences where all of his emails and sensitive personal information got rooted. What if Miles had thought to destroy the napkin with the evidence against him instead of conveniently leaving it in his office for Helen to find later? What if Miles had shot Helen anywhere except the magical bulletproof journal that she was wearing or bothered to check that she was actually dead? Oh, side note, several layers of paper and leather do not stop bullets. Why didn't he shoot Helen and Blanc together, thus eliminating his two biggest threats? Why did it take everyone so long to reach the scene of her apparent death when they were only a matter of yards away? Why did Blanc have a convenient bottle of chili sauce in his pocket to use his fake blood? Why didn't the supposed gun enthusiast notice when Miles stole the gun from his holster while he was wearing it? Why did Miles give Blanc a sample of the highly volatile energy source that he'd developed and then never ask for it back? Why do sprinklers not work on fire? Why does an explosion powerful enough to level a building cause no harm to the people inside the building? The thing is, I know what the answer to all these questions is going to be because the film straight up spells it out to us. It's just dumb! That's right folks, everything in this script that doesn't make sense is because the people involved were just really stupid. <laughs> Fuck. Honestly, I have never seen such a weak, pathetic attempt to excuse terrible writing in my life. It's on par with The Last Jedi Defenders, who conveniently brush aside the film's massive gaps in logic and common sense by saying, it's just a film about space wizards, it doesn't have to make sense. Well, Glass Onion isn't a space opera, it's a murder mystery, therefore it needs to make sense. The entire genre is predicated on the plot and character decisions making sense, and they absolutely don't here. People do and say the things they do for one reason and one reason only, so that the rest of the plot can happen. On the subject of the characters though, I have to say that nobody in this story has anything even resembling a nuanced personality. Again, the point of murder mysteries is that you're supposed to be introduced to what seems like a respectable group of people at first, only to gradually uncover the sinister secrets and misdeeds beneath. But here, everything is basically spelled out to you within the first five minutes of meeting each person. Characters are nothing but one-dimensional caricatures without a shred of originality or intrigue. The roided up wannabe alpha male who swaggers around shooting guns for no reason. The vapid fashion designer who doesn't even know what a sweatshop is. The corrupt politician taking bribes behind the scenes. I didn't care to learn anything about any of these people because there's just nothing to learn. There's no substance to any of them. They're just vectors for the story and even that 
isn't very good. Part of the fun of mysteries like this are the little breadcrumbs of information that they give to the audience to pick up, allowing them to form their own theories and conjectures so that when all of the pieces finally come together, it forms a coherent and logical pattern that you may or may not have spotted. That right there is the hallmark of good writing and it's completely lacking here. Characters pick up most of their clues by just happening to be in the right place and time to witness key events or overhear important conversations through sheer dumb luck. And this isn't even mentioning how Ryan blatantly rewrites previous events to show you what he wants you to see instead of what actually happens. Like this scene where Batista is watching his girlfriend supposedly having an affair with Miles only to be observed by Blanc. Now look at the later version of this exact same scene. Notice how Helen's been added in here when she totally should have been visible before. Stuff like this is lazy and cheap and it completely undermines the integrity of the story because you know that Ryan's basically just rewriting his own rules to suit whatever he wants to happen at that particular moment. Watching Glass Onion is like watching someone that's never played chess in their entire lives trying to take on a grandmaster, making up new rules and moves as they go to support the mistaken belief that they actually know what they're doing. It's the ego stroking pretentiousness of a filmmaker whose aspirations and self-belief far exceed his actual abilities and it's an insult to a genre that deserves far better than this gaudy superficial trash. It's just dumb! You said it, Matt LeBlanc. Anyway, that's all I've got for today. Go away now!